it cannot be split. So that one peak which I have which is unsplit must be the metoxy peak. Straight away I know that. And where does it come? 4. Why should it come at 4? It should because it is attached to an oxygen atom and therefore it is heavily de-sheeted. And that's the reason why I have it somewhere near 3.8. Again, of course, you have, you have the chemical shifts given to you and you also have the relative proton ratios given to you. You can use this information to actually analyze what your molecule is. So 3.8, unsplit. If it is unsplit, it must be the methoxy part of the molecule. Because methoxy has no flanking carbon atom with the hydrogen attached to it, no neighbors. Therefore, it must be unsplit. I therefore have that. Why, why am I getting this 7 and 8, 2 peaks? See, what has happened here is this is a para compound, right? One fourth compound. And therefore, you have two protons sitting adjacent to the, to the carboxyl or the carbonyl group. And you have two protons sitting adjacent to the methoxy. So if you have two groups here, non-equivalent, then this and this and this and this actually become non-equivalent. And therefore they will split. And the sort of pattern that you see there now, two slight shift, it's almost like a doublet of a doublet. And that basically tells you that I'm really looking at a para compound. I will not need you to analyze for me para or for meta because that's somewhat more uh, intriguing and more complicated when you analyze that. But at least, you know, once you analyze everything else, then what is left behind for these 6.91 and 7.93 is the ratio 1 is to 1 equal. And you have to multiply everything by 2, so that at 1.2 you have 3 protons, 2.93 you have 2 protons and so on. Which therefore tells me at 6.91 and 7.93, I have 2 protons each, and those 2 protons must be essentially the protons on the benzene ring. Okay. So, the sort of a split that you see at 7, the double of the double is very characteristic of a one fourth compound. But uh, you don't have to explain to me why that is the case. If you recognize that you see that split compared to a seven in this form, you know that it's a para compound. In the case of a beta compound, the split is going to be even more complicated. Also, also complicated. Para is going to give you a double of double the way I just said. But what I would really like you to do is to take these uh, data given in the box alongside. Look at the splitting pattern and then be able to tell us what the peaks are. Now this is something I really would like to pay a close attention because this tells us something about the dynamics in the whole process. This is ethanol. Into how many peaks must this be split into? Three. That is near one point something, and you see there are three peaks. That's perfectly fine. Into how many peaks should CH2 be split into? Four. But then, as we said just a while ago, if there's an OH out here, what happens? This must also, this is one, two, and a three bond coupling. This is a three bond coupling. But this proton and this proton are not equivalent. And in fact, part of the question that you asked me earlier will now get answered. I Say that at that time because we were waiting for this to happen. This is what is split into a quartet, and this has to split into a doublet. So, what's the spectrum I should really get? A quartet of a doublet or a doublet of a quartet, depending on how strong the splitting is. Sometimes the splitting can be so small that this may not even show up. This part may not even really show up in, in the splitting. But if this and this are both strong, reasonably strong, but unequal, then I must really see a doublet of a quartet. In other words, if that has a role to play, I'm not going to get a simple quartet, I'm going to get something more complicated than that. And what will happen to my OH? If the OH can split this guy, then this fellow will also split the OH. Then how much should the OH be split into? Into a triplet. So look at the first spectrum. I have a triplet near pi point something, and pi point something must be the OH proton because it's heavily de-shielded. The one point something must be the metal, and that is clearly split into three peaks, no question. But the one near three point something, three point six, which should be the CH two, is actually not split into a quartet. It's got more than that. So what does that mean? It simply means 
that this is actually being split by both of these and I really get a complicated structure which must be a doublet of a quadrant. That's what happens in spectrum 1. Look at spectrum 2, also a methanol. But what has happened in spectrum 2? The methyl is no problem, still the same. But what happened to the 5.3 peak? It is no longer a triplet, it is now a singlet. And then what has happened to the 3.8 ppm peak? It is no longer as complicated as the one above. It simply got split into a bunch of four peaks. As if to say, in the setting spectrum, this talks to this, this talks to this, this does not talk to any of these. Whereas in the first spectrum, this was involved in it. Now this, if this is involved in this, it simply means that the splitting or the coupling is quite strong. Therefore it is involved in this. But if it is quite strong in the top spectrum, why is it not talking in the bottom spectrum? What's the only difference between the top and the bottom? top is dry ethanol, meaning that I have removed every trace of moisture from the ethanol that I am using. But what's the next one? Ethanol has a small amount of an acid on to it. So what do you think will happen if I add an acid to ethanol? You can get protonated, right? But then I will have An equilibrium. Therefore, what is that telling me? I have the acid, I mean I have the ethanol, I've added some proton to it, proton protonates it, forms OH2 plus. Now let's not get into this whole question of elimination reaction here. I'm only talking about extremely small amounts and when the equilibrium has been established. Now when this releases the product, that's a strong acid, the conjugate acid. When that goes off, what will it do? It will give me back the ethanol. And what am I taking the spectrum of? I'm taking the spectrum of this entire mixture out here. Now what is going to happen to this proton here? It's sitting there. That all gets protonated. Now there are two protons. And when, they, when one of them leaves in the reverse process, any one of them can leave. It is not that the one that came later is the one that leaves. We don't know. Statistically, either of them could leave. So in a, in a sense, what are you doing? I'm taking ethanol and this proton is actually being exchanged in a very dynamical process, constantly. There's one proton, it goes away, another one comes in, goes away, the same one stays, little by later something else comes. This proton is actually being scrambled over and over again. What does that mean? It simply means the following, that it is quite likely the proton that is now present has a spin up. But when the proton got, when the ethanol got protonated, and this proton went out, the new one that comes in statistically has a 1 is to 1 probability of it being up or down. So essentially it means that as this equilibrium is going back and forth, what is happening to the nuclear spin of this proton? Half the time it is up and half the time it is down. And if this process is fast enough, what you essentially are going to see is only an average of these two orientations. And the average of up and down equal amount is basically zero. So in essence, what I'm trying to tell you is that if this equilibrium went ahead, and if this equilibrium process was fast compared to the NMR time scale, the NMR time scales are rather slow. They are not on the picosecond and femtosecond, which UV visible spectroscopy can give you. These are quite slow time scales, milliseconds or even slow. What then happens is the following: that this proton is actually replaced every now and then on a time scale that is extremely fast, and therefore the spin of that proton sitting here is not fixed up or down. It could be up, this by it could be down, back and forth, and therefore what you essentially see is an averaging. And when you see an averaging, the coupling is gone, because you really see only an average of up or down, which is zero, and therefore there is no coupling between this proton and the others that, that are around it. And it is that reason that forces that complicated multiplet structure at 3.5 and the triplet structure at 5.3 to vanish under conditions of small amounts of acid in your experiment. All I'm trying to say is that if there is anything that you do which scrambles the spins of the protons, like addition of small amounts of acid, then you will not see the coupling because the whole dynamical process is so fast that you don't see the proton as up or down, actually you see it flipping back and forth on a time scale that is extremely quick. And therefore, the coupling pattern simply will go away. Where else have you seen this? This is chemical way of destroying the coupling. 
we find carbon-13, right? And what did we do in carbon-13? In carbon-13, we said that if I have a carbon-13 and an H, what should the H do to this carbon? It should split this carbon-13 spectrum into how many features? Two features. But when will that happen? If this proton spin is defined for me. But then, if I irradiate this molecule with a frequency that corresponds to the precession of this proton, then what would happen? This proton is basically jumping back and forth on an extremely fast time scale, and therefore when the carbon looked at its neighbor to see in what spin orientation this is, it's half a time up, half a time down, and therefore it seems only an average, and what has happened to the coupling therefore? Coupling is gone. Therefore, if I had a doublet in the absence of the radiation, in the presence of the radiation, coupling is gone, therefore something like this would become something like this. We were actually destroying the coupling by inducing transitions from up state to down state by actually supplying the radiation and making this transition in the NMR spectrum. Over there, we are doing the same thing. But we are not doing it by supplying radiation. We are simply doing it chemically by keeping this proton switching around all the time. When the new proton comes in and attaches itself to the oxygen, it might be spin down. There's a 50-50 statistical probability that the one that comes in may be up or down. And since you have a large number of protons to go around, large number of molecules to go around, I know I've got a number, statistics works quite well, which essentially means that half the time this proton is seeing this up and half the time it is seeing it down, but this time scale is so small, on an average, what you see is basically zero or day. Up and down on an average is going to be horizontal. Therefore, you can see a spin associated with that proton. And that's the reason why this coupling is essentially destroyed. So, when you look at alcoholic compounds, there are two reasons as to why you may not get the alcoholic peak to couple with the neighbor. One, it could be an extremely small coupling. Second, unless you do the experiments under absolutely dry conditions, no moisture, no water, no acid, you don't even need to add acid to it. If it had water in it, water is a strong enough acid. It will cause this total transfer to occur. So if you have some moisture, if you have some um, alcohol, if there are traces of moisture in it, traces of water in it, you will find this happening. So unless you had bone dry ethanol, you are not going to get the spectrum that you got in stress. That's the reason why it is said it's dry ethanol. It has to be dry ethanol for you to be able to see all these companies. But if you had a trace of moisture, a trace of acid, the proton exchange is not going to happen on time scales that are so quick that you will not see this coupling therefore the coupling is gone. So whenever you have OH containing compounds, this is something you want to keep in mind. And if you don't see a coupling, it could be one of two things. Coupling is weak, therefore I'm not seeing it. Or the compound is not dry and therefore I'm not seeing it. So both reasons must be taken into account. If you have to explain why is it that the OH is not inducing a coupling or a splitting of its adjacent Okay, we won't go through the, some of the others because I will send this to you and I want you to look at them. But let me look at something else for you. <coughs> yeah, let's look at this spectrum. And this is a carbon 13 spectrum of 2 butanol, which is of course shown there. So here I am looking at carbon-13. Can I look at carbon-13 without interference from the proton? Yes, because the carbon has a G value which is one fourth. The G value of carbon is one fourth. It must actually have a lama precession frequency that is very, very different from the lama precession frequency of the hydrogens. So, if, and I can still use the tetrametal silane as my reference. Why? Tetrametal silane has carbon in it. So I can use that as my reference. So, what I can do now is actually look at the spectrum of carbon, which is going to come at a lama precession frequency that is one fourth the value of what I would see for hydrogen. Therefore, if hydrogen were to spin at, let us say, 400 megahertz on a 400 megahertz machine, what would the carbon nuclei? You would all these 
law of assessing at 100 megahertz. Therefore, I can go to a different window and look at them without any interference from the high needs. If both of them have very comparable G values, then what would happen? The two spectra would sort of overlap with each other, and then I wouldn't know whether the peaks I'm seeing are due to hydrogen or whether they are due to carbon. Here I don't have a problem because carbon has a precession frequency which is one fourth of what the hydrogen would give under the same feed. So if I put methanol or butanol into this magnetic feed, both the protons are processing and the carbon 13 nuclei are processing. But I can look at carbon 13 without interference from the proton. Not a problem. You can, you can do that. How many different carbons are there in this case? One, two, three, four. All four are different carbons, and therefore each one of them. And who's the, uh, what's the species that is really talking to me in this experiment? It's a carbon 13. Most of them are carbon 12. 99% of the population is actually carbon 12, which is of no use to me in a NMR experiment. I'm simply relying on the fact that nature has given me 1% of carbon 13 as a natural abundance, and which is what I'm using for these experiments. That's the reason why in some NMR experiments, if you feel that your carbon, your spectrum is too weak and you've got to get better spectra, what would you do? You would actually synthesize compounds by specifically inserting carbon-13 where you want. Now I have a much larger concentration of carbon-13 and therefore the spectrum becomes that much better. And you will have to do that sometimes. It's called labeling of a compound with the isotope for the purpose of getting better spectra. But for most of these compounds, the sensitivity of the Fourier transform instrument is so good that even if the concentration of the carbon-13 is 1%, which is a natural abundance, you still can get a good spectrum. What are the things we said really hurts us when we took carbon-13? First, population. Only 1%. What else? G-value is small. Small splitting.